Welcome, welcome. Thank you everyone for coming for our next event in the community education mountain safety calendar that we have. Uh, I really want to thank our speakers for coming and sharing their stories with us. I think a lot of times when we hear about accidents, we try to distance ourselves from those people or those actions, but tonight's really about understanding, about getting closer to those people, those incidents, and understanding it uh, a little bit better. And hopefully you kind of walk away thinking a little bit more about what might you do in a rescue? How are you prepared when you go in the backcountry? You might also think that we do good events and want to come back. <laughs> We're doing another great workshop. This is kind of advertising for us. We're doing a workshop June 8th. You can mark your calendars. It's going to be a full day of hands-on training. It'll be a workshop schedule where we'll have four different tracks. So a navigation track, a medical track, a survival track, and a self-care track. And you'll come, you'll choose your classes, and it'll be a full day. You'll get a med kit and lunch. So if nothing else, you get lunch out of it. Uh, last thing I just kind of wanted to mention, so, you know, all these rescues, everything that we do here, these are all team accomplishments. It takes a lot of people to pull these off. And so we kind of asked all our speakers just to refer to all individuals just as rescuer. They might mix up, drop a name or two. But recognize that when there is one of these accidents, when we do respond to a rescue, that person might only see one or two people. But often we're sending 10, 20, there's a lot of people involved in making these rescues happen and being able to pull these off safely. So it really does take a lot of people. A lot of them are here in this room. We're all wearing name tags. So at some point you want to check out the building, you want to buy some swag, you just want to say hi, grab a member, say hi. Uh, we're generally all pretty friendly. And that's it. So uh, our first speaker here is actually one of our members, Landon Dean. She'll be talking about an incident she had. So kind of all the stories you'll hear tonight fit into a different pattern we see. So this is, we respond to a lot of medical incidents. And she's going to talk about a medical incident she had when she was off internationally in Burma. Um, Bhutan. Bhutan. Should have corrected that <laughs> one. If that's the second worst thing that happens today, we'll be all right. <laughs> we got a typo and a missed up projector. Yeah, somewhere else. We didn't have anything to do with it. So here's Landon. Hello? Oh, this worked. <laughs> Hi, my name's Landon Dean. Uh, I've been on the team for about 30 years. I grew up here in Aspen. And, uh, or, excuse me, I think it was October of 2013, a couple friends of mine asked if I wanted to go to Bhutan for a, a trek. And Bhutan is a place that I, I literally had no idea where I was going, but it's a little country that um, is located near Nepal, up in the Himalayan mountains. It's very similar to Nepal geographically. So I headed out literally not knowing, I kind of forgot to look on a map where we were going. So 45 hours later, we landed there. I did not have... Um, any opportunity to sleep, so I was pretty exhausted when I arrived. Um, prior to going, we had um, been training a lot. Uh, we were supposed to do a trek called the Laya Trek, which is, if anybody's ever heard of um, Bhutan, they might know of the Snowman Trek, which is technically the hardest trek in the entire world. It goes over some, God knows how many 16,000 foot passes, and the Laya Trek is basically half of that. So it was supposed to be about a 15-day journey. We were going to do it in 12, so we had trained really um, heavily for it. And our particular um, trek was going to go over four 16,000-foot passes. So it's a little hard to train around here for that altitude, but we spent a lot of time up at 12.5 um, and 13,000, so we figured we were probably pretty good. So we landed in um, Bhutan, got a good night's sleep finally, and we started out the next morning um, at about 9,000 foot elevation. The, um, the town that we flew into was roughly about the same as Aspen, and we drove up to the trailhead and off we went. First night was great. Uh, the picture over here on the left shows you the type of countryside it was. It was just um, kind of high altitude jungle. 
um, it soon moved into um, more higher elevation where we were up above Timberline, but it still was very deceiving. It didn't feel, the, the, the trail was very easy and it didn't seem like that difficult. So I think I was sort of lulled into complacency when the second night, I just didn't sleep at all. And we were at about 11,000 feet and tossed and turned all night. I just it was, I, I just didn't feel good. Next morning I woke up, we um, hiked up to, the, to this camp here, which actually had a number of different other um, groups that were coming and going. There's a lot of treks around there. And um, on the way up, I, I started to feel like I had the flu. I felt very lethargic, I had a scratchy throat. By the time I got to camp, I was starting to cough a lot, and I thought, oh man, I'm going on this 15-day trip, and, or 12-day trip, because we were doing it fast, and now I'm starting to get sick. So I took some vitamin C tablets and whatnot, and I went to bed, and I, because I hadn't been sleeping very well, I took a sleeping pill just so I could force myself to sleep, and I woke up the next morning feeling you know, a little bit better, and all these people from the surrounding camps came over to me, and they said, are you all right? And I kept looking, and I was like, why? <laughs> they said, I kept, I kept everybody up all night coughing, but I didn't know it. So we started off um, on the third day to um, go up over the top of our first big pass, which was around 15,000 something. It was pretty high. And by the way, 15,000 something, almost 16,000 feet is substantially higher than 14,000 feet. If you've never been up at altitude, your body really um, reacts differently when you start getting higher. Um, it wasn't very long into that day's hike where I really started feeling bad. I got a terrible stomach ache, horrible, horrible nausea, super bad headache, and I just felt like I'd hit a wall, and I'm usually pretty good. I'm very athletic and can kind of do whatever I need to do. And it just was killing me. So we finally made it up to the top of the pass. And I um, I just, I thought I was going to die. I mean, I, I didn't even know. I was like, man, if this is this bad three days into, I'm not going to make 12 days. We dropped off the pass and my headache kind of subsided a little bit. The nausea subsided. And we went down into this um, big valley, which if you want to change to the next, um, where we spent the next night. And this was actually a bowl. I know it has water going out, but you couldn't really actually go out where the water was. And the only way to get back out of that, our intended path was to go up on this trail and continue for the next X amount of days that we were going to go. There is a trail over here, which was a shortened um, uh, a hike that a lot of people were going to do that we had met in some of the camps, which was about four days back to the main city of Timpu. And then, of course, the one that we came over, I was, actually, I think it was the fourth day by the time we'd gotten there. So the bottom line is, is I'm at minimum four days from anywhere. And this bowl was such that the only way you could get out of it was to hike up to go down. So anyhow, we get to camp that night and um, I've never felt so sick in my entire life. I started to shiver really badly, too, and I was shaking so badly I couldn't even hold a cup of tea. And I was taking hot water bottles. They poured boiling water in, and I'd stick them down in my jackets. And it, it, it wasn't snowing or freezing yet, so it obviously wasn't down to 32. And I had everything I owned on, and I was just just felt horrible. So I didn't really eat that night, and I thought, well, I'll go to bed. And as soon as I lay down, um, so I knew I was, so I was in really big trouble. My lungs had filled up with fluid, and I didn't know it at the time until I lay down. Then all of a sudden, I felt like I was drowning. And I couldn't breathe at all. I mean, it was every time I tried to take a breath, it, it sounded like I was crumpling a, a water bottle. Just the, it was what they call crackles, which I'll, you'll learn more about here in a minute. But 
um, when I'd try to breathe, it would make me cough. And when I'd cough, water would just come pouring out of my mouth. I mean, like, pouring out, like you'd see in a movie where somebody's drowning and they do CPR and then blah, and all the water comes out. And I was absolutely terrified because I couldn't get a breath at all. And the only way I could breathe was to pant. And so I was sitting there just kind of <laughs> panting, and I, I had um, lost all my ability to think. And I, I don't know if it was from the hypoxia or from, um, from panting. You know, I might have messed up all my CO, CO2 levels and whatnot. Bottom line is, is I didn't think I was going to make it through the night. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I was so out of it. I couldn't understand what was going on. I was in complete survival mode. When, um, when about morning-ish came, all of a sudden, I just had one lucid thought that came in my mind. I thought, oh, shit, I know what's wrong with me. I've got hape. In Mountain Rescue, we spend a lot of time learning about high-altitude injuries. And one of them is high-altitude pulmonary edema. Another one is high-altitude cerebral edema. Um, high-altitude pulmonary edema is basically water in your lungs, and cerebral edema is water in your brain. And it's 100% fatal, both of them. One is very quick. The cerebral edema is within hours. And the pulmonary edema is within a couple days. And I was like, oh my God, I know what's wrong, but I can't remember what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> and so I grabbed my bag, and once I set up, set up I sat up, excuse me, um, I could think a little bit clearer, and I, I, I didn't feel like I was suffocating quite so much, and I, I don't know why it didn't occur to me earlier in the evening to do something about, like sit up or something, I, I don't know. I was just so hypoxic. So anyhow, I went over to my bag, and I was like, I, I know I have something in here that can help me. And I rummaged around, and I had purchased an inReach, which is a, a satellite texting device, right before I left. And I had, you can sync it to your cell phone, so you have the ability to use your contacts to, um, to text and whatnot. But I had never read the directions. And I was so out of it. There was no way I could read any directions. But luckily, it was intuitive enough that I was able to figure out how to turn it on and to send a text message back here to a couple people. But nobody answered, so I didn't know if I had done it right. So I waited, and I waited, and waited. And it's still dark out. It's kind of like right in that you know, early stages of dawn where you can just kind of tell things are getting light, and nobody else was awake. And, um, and so I waited for about a half an hour, and then I texted another person that I knew always was standing there looking at their phone. It is 12 hours difference, so it was about 5 in the morning where I was, so it was 5 in the evening back here, and that person answered immediately, and I was like, oh, thank God, it's working. And I said, I really need some help. You need to get a hold of somebody for me, and I gave him a couple numbers. And um, one thing led to another, and I ended up um, getting in contact with Steve Ayers, who's an ER doctor here, um, and a very good friend of mine. He's actually saved my life three times now. I love Steve. <laughs> Anyhow, so Steve said, I've got to talk to you on the phone. I said, Steve, our phones don't work up here. And they actually have... Um, solar satellite towers all over Bhutan, even though it's a very, um, I want to say backwards country, because that's not quite right, because they're actually more advanced than we are, but it's a very primitive country. They've only just opened their borders to tourists, but they have these towers all over in the back country. They have no roads or anything, but they have all these cell phone towers, but they only work when the sun comes up, and we hadn't been able to make our cell phones work. And by then, my um, campmates who were up and they kind of knew what was going on and he said no I've got to figure out a way to talk to you and right then my friend's um, cell phone came to life and she said oh my god my phone's working so anyhow I talked to him and he listened to my story and he said Landon you you're in trouble he said this was about eight in the morning and he said you've got about 12 hours to live 
And he said, well, actually, he said, you've got about 12 hours, and then you'll go unconscious, and then you maybe have another 12 hours before you're dead. You have got to get out of there. And I said, Steve, I can't get down in altitude. I'm, I'm in a bowl. And he said, well, you've got to get on. We had these little horses that were carrying our pack, um, pack stuff. He said, you've got to get on one of the horses and ride out of there. And I said, Steve, it's going to take me nine hours just to get to the same elevation where I am, and I have to go up over a 16,000-foot pass. I'm going to die on the horse. And he said, you got to go. So they started packing up um, camp. And um, of course, the best option would have been a helicopter, but they don't have hel At the time, they didn't have helicopters in Bhutan. Um, but what I didn't know is the, at the time, was um, the guide was talking to his office. And in the process of talking, they walked out. One of the guys in the office had walked, it was at the airport, and walked out on the ramp. And there's a helicopter sitting on the ramp. So he runs out, and he bangs on the canopy, and he says, can you do this rescue? And the guy was buckled in. Blades running, he was just getting ready to take off. He had been in the country for about a week doing some work on some um, on some electrical moving moving transformers or something. And he was heading back to Nepal, where he lived. And he said, if you can extend my visa, which <coughs> comes due in an hour, if you can get me a um, permit to do the rescue, and you can get her insurance company to agree to it, I'll do the rescue. Well, it was Saturday, and it was the descending of Buddha, which is the most, um, the biggest holiday for Buddhists. It's way bigger than Christmas for Christians. And everything was closed in the whole country. And he managed to get, they, they, somehow they managed to get all of those in one hour. <laughs> so anyhow, he came and um, they had really high winds on one of the passes, and he tried and tried and tried, couldn't get there, and um, came over, or the, the winds quit right at the last second. He popped over, came, and he got me and brought me back to Timpu. Unfortunately, um, Timpu's at about 8,000 feet, and it wasn't low enough. And um, as soon as I landed, they took me to the hospital, and f for some reason they thought, I was going to be okay enough that they sent me to the hotel. And um, that night, I got a lot worse. And by next morning, I had um, deteriorated considerably. And it was very similar to other situations we see here on the team where when you rescue someone, they kind of, they're like, I'm safe now. And then they their body gives up. And I think that's what happened to me. Bottom line is I had to wait for um, eight days before I could leave Timpu and get down to lower elevation because... Um, they didn't have any airlines. Oh, there's only there's only eight pilots in the world that can fly into um, Bhutan because it's very dangerous, and um, so I had to wait to get a flight out. I did survive, which was great. <laughs> what did I learn from that experience? One is is that it's very oh there there's uh, that's Pemba uh, who's who rescued me. This is my uh, angel. He now works for Flight for Life, and he lives um, over in Montrose. <laughs> which is kind of amazing. <laughs> that is a whole other part of the story. But um, it's altitude uh, can be really deceiving. And I grew up at 8,000 feet. And I, I mean, how, how come I couldn't be fine? You know, especially at 11,000 is when I started having my problem. And I, I have to say that the countryside was very deceiving because it didn't look high altitude. And I thought, God, I should just be absolutely fine. And I wasn't. And the... I probably, if I had spent more time acclimating, probably would have been fine, but I don't even know that because I have had problems with altitude since I've been back. But um, the biggest thing I can say is, is that I cannot believe how grateful I was to everybody who saved me. They, they, people bent over backwards to rescue me, and I have always been the person on the other side and all of a sudden, now I'm the person who couldn't solve the problem. I, no matter all my knowledge, all my training, I just couldn't solve the problem. I was, I was dying. And these people just killed themselves off trying to help me. And 
they came and saved me, and I'm so grateful for that. And since then, I have to say that I've, um, it, it, when you're in a rescue situation, um, you have to develop kind of a compartmentalized way of dealing with rescues, because otherwise you go insane, because you, you can't, you can't have a whole lot of empathy, otherwise you can't do your job. And since this situation, <laughs> I freaking ball at everything. I am like the, so empathetic. I mean, I just, kitten videos just send me, I, I have a hard time doing rescues now because going into the field because I'm, I'm almost too empathetic because I've been there and I know what it's like and I know what it's like to feel so desperate and to rely on people and not have the ability to do it yourself. And so anyhow, I kind of have a hard time doing rescue, so I'm kind of doing a lot more of the training on the team now. <laughs> but anyhow, it was, it was one of the best experiences of my entire life. I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change one minute of it. But yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yes, Carol. Okay. Were you taking any dialogues or anything like that? Well, this so she asked if I was taking any Diamox, which is a um, medicine that you can take that helps you um, acclimate quicker. The answer is, is I had it with me. I didn't start it until the, um, the third day, or the day that I was in the, the valley where it got really bad. And um, whether that would have helped me in advance, they, um, we've had a lot of discussions about this with the doctor. It might have. Um, I kind of have a feeling I have a genetic issue with high altitude, so I probably, it, I don't know. But the answer is, is I will try to die mox if I ever go at altitude again, way before I go. Yes, thanks. Yeah. As you were talking, you were talking like, so almost like you were by yourself the whole time. Were you relaying? I mean, That's a really good question. Um, so she asked if it, it sounded like I was by myself. And the reality is I, I, there were people there, but the guides were not trained in high altitude um, injuries. And my two hiking mates had no idea. They, they didn't understand. And understandably, there's no reason you would know about high altitude injuries unless you're on mountain rescue or something. <laughs> I know. And it, so it was, I, I did... In essence, I was alone. I had to make their own decisions because nobody even knew what was going on. They didn't understand the severity of it. And so I felt, I did feel very alone too. I felt like I was the only one who really could make any decisions because they didn't really know what was going on. But that was, yeah, that was a good point. Yes. Well, that was, uh, the, the question was, is um, in the eight days that I was at Timpu waiting for the girls to come back out and, and to get a flight back out, did I go back to the hospital? Did I get any more treatment? I naively thought that communication was a little difficult there. I had a lot of problems with internets going down, the phones weren't really working, so I had difficulty communicating with back here to, um, to Aspen to clarify this. But I naively thought, oh, I'm down in altitude, I should be fine. So I didn't really, I'd never been around somebody who was recovering from HAPE, so I thought that was kind of normal. Come to find out, once I get back, that I was definitely still dying. I just was dying a little bit slower. And um, I've been to a few specialists since I've been back, and they were absolutely flabbergasted that I made it after making it down to Timpu. <laughs> so, and I ended up with some um, other issues like some tachycardic issues and whatnot too from it. I think it damaged my heart actually. It, I think it's better now, but it wasn't at the time. Yes. Well, I'm just curious when you got down to the hospital, since there are people climbing around there and mountaineering, did they have, uh, is it gamma bags? Or they yes. So there's a, um, a device called a gamo bag. She asked if, if um, they had, or at least down in the hospital, if they had a gamo bag, which is a, it looks a bit like a, an enclosed sleeping bag that they can pump up with air and it will simulate um, you going to a lower altitude. Kind of like um, a decompression, a teeny weeny little 
portable decompression chamber? The answer is actually we had a gamo bag up there, but the guides had never used it. Um, we sort of ironically practiced with it a few days before, but um, the problem with a gamma bag, and I know this from my training, is once you put somebody in that, you're, the, you, can't, you can't transport them. And I didn't know if I was gonna have to be on the horse or not, and you can't ride a horse in a gamma bag. So I was, <laughs> I was uh, hoping the helicopter would show up at that point. It would have been a very, very, very last minute thing. They did not have one in the hospital, and the reason why they actually cleared me at the hospital was we did run into some um, hikers, trekkers that were right near us who had a medicine called dexmethasone, which can help your symptoms. It's actually not helping hape, but it can help you feel better for just a little bit. The hape is still progressing, but it just makes you feel like you don't feel quite as bad as you do. So I had um, had quite a bit of dexamethasone on board when, um, when I was flown out. So when I went to the hospital, it appeared as though it was a little bit better. And hindsight, of course, I should have gone back to the hospital and I should have probably spent eight days on oxygen, but I didn't really know, you know, it's time is a, yeah, I'm very, just very lucky to be here. <laughs> Yes. Hi. Thank you. Um, it's a good question. He asked if I uh, feel as though my pulmonary health is um, recovered and also have I tried to go back up in altitude. The answer is yes on both, but it took me, it took me a solid year and a half before um, I felt as though, I think I scarred my heart or something um, when that happened. And, um, and I never, I didn't really feel very good for about a year and a half. That being said, a year after it happened, I went and climbed Pyramid, and um, we were up top, and uh, from about 13, 1-ish to the top, oh, my lungs started to fill up with fluid again, and by the time I got to the top, I know that, I know, hindsight's 20, 20. Um, <laughs> when I was on the way up, I was like, oh, it's just right there, I'll keep going, and I started to get really dizzy, and my lungs were full, and I'm coughing, and I get to the top, and I'm coughing, and water's pouring out, and um, luckily, I made it back down, um, and I went back in to see Steve. Um, I was like, Steve, just kind of interesting, my hate came back. <laughs> of course, it went away right when I came down, but um, I was like, what's going on? So anyhow, that's when we figured out I probably had a genetic issue with altitude or something's going on. But no, I feel like a million bucks now. I feel really good. Um, my body doesn't really like high altitude, though. I mean, I'll go climb the bowl and get to about Heart Attack Hill, and I know we all kind of die there, but I really die at there. So I have to go a lot slower now. Um, oh, yeah, well, no. Hi, uh, my question is Aaron. Um, Thank you. I have a question, and it has to do more with you. I don't know if you ever saw a but you said that there are many thousand feet and some of the clearly symptoms. So, I mean, it feels, I see that you are very confident so, right now. I wonder, I wonder if that is recovery. In other words, like, the chain of events that yeah, could be covered. I mean, you couldn't go down, but maybe what can be heard in television. Totally. <laughs> yeah, what he asks is if my um, confidence probably led to my issue, and the answer is yes, absolutely. I mean, I was incredibly fit at the time. I'd been in the backcountry most of my life. Um, we are on this track. I mean, I flew all the way across the world to go on this track. I mean, and I'm only two days into it. Of course, I only had a cold, right? And um, it was, that was one of the toughest moments is when I was almost dead um, to even say, gosh, I am really in trouble now. 
and I need to pull the plug and get out of here somehow. And that was actually really, really hard because, again, you're on this track. You paid all this money. You've gone on, you know, I'm on a, a flow, flew halfway around the world and whatnot. And at what point, you know, I kept thinking, God, there's got to be some medicine maybe if we just hang out for a few days. So that initial decision, no, this is it. i got to get out of here. Um, and it's very difficult to get out of there. This wasn't like you turn around and go back to the parking lot and drive back down from Maroon Bells. This was... I mean, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I am really in the middle of nowhere. So pulling the plug and getting out of there was a very difficult thing. And I felt so guilty. It was so funny because I can't, I don't really remember much about the helicopter ride, but I remember feeling really, really guilty that I was ruining everybody's vacation. And I know that was kind of crazy, but, you know, your mind doesn't think right sometimes. But, yeah, that's a good, good point. And the last one? Okay. Do one more from home. <laughs> 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 I just wondered where the water in your life comes from. Well, I learned a lot about HAPE after I got back because <laughs> I ended up seeing a lot of specialists, some of the best in the world. And this is actually incredibly interesting. Well, it's incredibly interesting to me. When we're um, fetuses, there is um, a... Um, a, a reaction that we have inside our body so that when we are in a low oxygen situation, the cells around our arteries and our lungs clamp down so that nothing is happening in our lungs. So we'll get all our blood and everything through our umbilical cord. That process still stays with us when we're older. But what happens is that it's called pulmonary hypertension. All of Every, um, every artery in our lungs clamps down a little bit when we come to altitude. That's why you end up with acute mountain sickness and get the headache. You know, when you come up to altitude and you feel nauseous and you get the headache for a few days until we can develop enough of the red blood cells to compensate for that. <coughs> what happens in HAPE is they call it uneven pulmonary hypertension, where some of the... Um, the cells scrunch down and tighten down around the uh, arteries and other ones don't. So what happens in the ones that don't, there's so much pressure going through there, it actually squishes the plasma in your blood through the cell walls and it fills up all your little alveoli areas with fluid. And so if you were to look at an x-ray, you'll see it looks patchy. And those are the areas where the unevenness has happened. It doesn't happen to everyone. It only happens to some people. It doesn't only happen to just the same some people. Sometimes somebody can go up to altitude 20 times and on the 21st time it happens. They don't really understand why it happens. But what's happening is you're basically drowning. So your lungs fill up with fluid. It is 100% fatal unless you either get down in altitude or you get on constant oxygen, which obviously I didn't have constant oxygen up there and I couldn't get down in altitude. And so it's very, very important when um, you, your lungs fill up with fluid that you have to get treatment because you can't stop it in any other way. And your lungs will fill up to the point where you're, you can't breathe because you're drowning. So you're basically drowning from the inside out. Yeah, it's horrifying. Yes, thank you very much. So the plan is we'll, we're going to have one more uh, group of speakers come up. That was great. Thank you very much. Very informative. Learned a lot. We're going to have one more group of speakers come up. Then we'll take a quick break, go eat some snacks. Uh, we have lots of food here. Uh, we're trying to repeat the questions back because we are filming it. It will be up on our YouTube channel later. We've done a few other events in the past. So if you missed those, you can go back and watch them. And someday in the future, when we have time and budget for it, we'll probably try to go through and edit some of these events and pull out little sound bites to use in future kind of promotional material and whatnot. So that's what that's all about. Our next set of speakers are some local guys who are out backcountry skiing in the backcountry area near Aspen um, and had a little incident. They'll come on up. Maybe we'll start as they're making their way here. 
what's kind of neat, the beauty of GoPro, we get to watch it. <laughs> we get to see what happened. I'll let you guys guess who was skiing. Wave, wave, wave. Rock it up, bro. Yep. notice in that last part how he tried to move his leg and the leg didn't quite move the same yeah you can kind of again the video is not great I'm not a doctor but it's not supposed to look like that so with that said here we have Jeff King Greg Ernst Willie Klein they're gonna talk to us a little bit about uh, what went down there this is Jeff King. I'm Jeff King clearly So I guess I'll start from the beginning of that day, which was a lot better than that. Um, earlier that day, we got a bunch of snow late that night, and we were uh, skiing out back of Ajax for most of the afternoon. Um, really good day, super fun, and we decided that at one point we were going to ski to the road, something that we generally like to do um, that we haven't got to do since la the year before was so low with snow. Um, so about, you know, around 3 o'clock, we got on the gondola and headed up to Harris Headwall. Skied down Harris Headwall, um, down up to Difficult, hiked up, and then right where that video started is where uh, it's kind of this place called Hot Rocks. Um, that we <laughs> decided to then venture on, and then at that point, some place that I have skied before and known before, but just got a little lost in made one wrong turn and uh, had nowhere to go, as you can tell in those trees. Um, my first initial reaction was, one, um, get the snow off my face as I was a little worried that I had a little bit more snow than I thought. Um, the f then the second was, shit, my season's over because I know my leg's broken. <laughs> uh, and then the third was, I now need to scream for help. So, you know, these guys know that this is serious. Um, at that point, Greg, who was closest to me, um, then hiked up about, took you about, what, 40 minutes? Yeah, half, hour. half hour to get up to me. I got eventually from upside down, I eventually got around, put um, both skis off, um, and then I eventually, with his help, got my one good leg ski back on. At this point, um, I'll let Greg talk about the communication he had with the patrol and the mountain rescue in a little bit here. But at this point, you know, I didn't really know how bad it was broken. I didn't know what our plan was, but from my recollection, I was like, all right, we're going to just, we're going to have to get out. And that was the main concern and how we were going to do that. Um, initially, Greg, <laughs> it did not go as well when we first started moving. Um, it was two or three feet of snow and I was kind of sliding through and it was painful and it was hard to balance. Um, about maybe 60, 70 feet from where I was, I got out to this open clearing and I don't know if anybody's been up there. It's very rolling kind of hills as you go down through trees and tight shoots into a ravine. So at that point, um, after cursing and swearing, 
Um, I got to a point where I went down some on one leg. I skied down and just lost balance and fell. And you know, Greg looked at me and goes, "We got to call Mountain Rescue. <laughs> like this is, we need to let Art know that we need to. Like I'm not going to be able to get down." Um, at that point, Willie, we met up with Willie, who was a little bit below us, and Greg side slipped through trees and rocks and around cliff bands, and Willie kind of was my crutch as much as he could be, even though there was a few moments where I was swinging his pole at my ski <laughs> as I fell. Um, for about, and then about two hours had passed, um, it was getting dark and the boys decided that this wasn't gonna happen. We were, we were not skiing down and we needed help. At that moment, Greg and Willie let me sit and rest for a little bit. <laughs> um, they went down, found a spot right by a tree and um, built a fire. Um, and then right before Greg talks about the communication, just what was going through my mind was one, holy shit, I feel bad for what these guys are gonna have to do to come up and get me. <laughs> and the second thing was you didn't, you know, you, we don't want to call them because we feel like we want it, we can do it ourselves to get out. I think that's kind of how I look at it, was all right, I don't want to bother these guys, I don't want to waste these guys' time. You feel bad that you put people through that. Um, so I was pretty thankful and fortunate that we had a paramedic come up and you know, what they had to do, it's just, they're animals for what they, <laughs> I mean, that was a grueling, grueling skin. So, but I'll let the communication part, Greg, take. So, just not to go too far back into, you know, where it all started, but, um, you know, we were all skiing along independently, and uh, I just heard Jeff screaming, and at that point, I knew that I had to stop, figure out where he was, kind of assess, you know, to the best of that I could, how bad was it really? Um, and that's the point where I, before I even started hiking up to get him, I had made a phone call to ski patrol on Ajax, just because I kind of thought that, that was going to be an easier an easier route to get him was going to be to come down from the top um, than to come up from the bottom. So the original call was actually at around four o'clock. Um, so yeah, then at that point I was hiked back up to Jeff assess the situation, communicate with Willie, who was below us, even then at that point. Um, we did have some cell phone service, so we could talk on a phone. Um, and then, yeah, the f two hours of Jeff grunting it out to get down as far as we could, just because we knew we were gonna be battling daylight, and just kind of figured that the further down we could get, the better it was gonna be for, for the rescue situation. I mean, it took us two hours to get you know what I mean? Thousand vertical feet, maybe, not even. And um, yeah, I mean Jeff toughed it out, skied on one leg, and uh, got down as far as we could until we couldn't, you know, couldn't see anymore. Jeff wasn't able to move. Made a fire. That was probably a little bit excessive for, <laughs> for just for keeping warm. Um, it was a large but, uh, fire. Like you know, all in all, I guess we were, you know, we we as soon as the incident happened. We kind of knew we were dealing with daylight, knew that it was going to be a serious situation, didn't lose our cool, kept calm, just did one thing at a time. Um, we're able to communicate with everybody here in the dispatch. Um, and yeah, we just sat it out and waited for the guys to come up and get us. And I think all in all, it took uh, it was like a six hour ordeal from the time the incident occurred until we were down to the bottom. We were pretty fortunate where Greg stopped. It was, I guess there's one part, yeah, there's there's no cell service from where he made the initial call till we started skiing. So when he stopped and he was able to speak to someone at Mountain Rescue and be able to give the coordinates off our cell phone, which is pretty amazing, and that's how they knew exactly where we were, it was, you know, if they didn't have lighters in that cell service, I mean, if, if, yeah, we, we, have <laughs> we have more options, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> Willie said he still thinks he can make it without the lighter, but <laughs> I was <laughs> doubtful. We have beacons and batteries and white gum wrappers. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Science guy over here all of a sudden. But, I mean, we were, I mean, that fire, and if you think about it, and you know what I mean, and everything worked out for us and for me, and and once you're down, you're down. But if I didn't have that fire, that escalates that situation because I'm just in a shell and a one layer underneath, sweating, sweating and <laughs> profuse. <laughs> so that was, you know. All right, I'll tell you guys my perspective of this and what I learned. <laughs> It started out, these guys came down, told me how great the skiing was, and I should come with them for one lap. And we, the hardest part for me was I heard someone yelling, and I thought there was someone else out in the woods, but there was no tracks in front of us. And I heard Greg yell, so I stopped, and the hardest part for me was waiting for that, like, 45 minutes, just in one spot for them to get down, because I wanted to go get help. But the we were not in a good situation to split up with the snow conditions, so that was the hardest part for me was waiting for the rest of the guys to get down. You had some good ideas. We were They were going to splint me. We were going to have one on left, one on right, kind of like hold me and glide me down. And there was a lot of... The hard way. There was, there was a lot of ideas. We were good. Yeah, it was... For how bad the situation was, it went perfectly. Everything that went right went right, so we were really lucky for what happened. Yeah, any questions? How long did it take Ski Patrol to get up? It, Mountain Rescue came and got us, and what do you think? Uh, I mean, timing was hard for, I mean, for me from what I know, and I think Ski Patrol from when I remember was going back and forth to Mountain Rescue, which, which, which way was better, to come go up on sleds and come down and get me? And then I think eventually Mountain Rescue said skinning up was safer with the current snow conditions. So at the time, like I want to say s 8 o'clock, close to around 8 was when we first the first headlamp came through. And I think we were down by, what, 10, 30, 11? Yeah, we were down at like 8.45. We were down, qu were we down quick? How you guys... It, we went down very fast. Jeff had been medicated. We, f we flew down. <laughs> it was very fast. It was very impressive. Mountain rescue. The guys got up Four there, guys. I think, in 45 minutes, and then it was 45 minutes down. But putting in an air cast, getting the toboggan, doing the whole process. It was quick. It was, you know, that was what took up a lot of the time. So. I thought getting there took up most of the time. <laughs> oh, sorry. For it was yeah. So uh, so Greg made the call the minute he's before he started hiking. So that was maybe you know five minutes after it happened, or a few minutes after when he heard before he started hiking up. Um, and I then told him to wait. <laughs> give us two hours to get down. <laughs> I I I thought uh, we might be able to do it. Originally, I didn't know how broken my leg was. Yeah. So I didn't know it was what you saw, like I didn't know it was in three spots. I didn't know if it was an ankle. I knew it was something serious enough that I couldn't put weight on it. And I think my, your instinct is, I don't want to, your instinct I think is you don't want to bother people. And so adrenaline. your adrenaline's kicking in. You want to get down. You, you know, we live in a small town. You don't want this getting around. You made it, you know, uh, essentially it was an accident that happened in the back country. And like what you said, we were out there at later than we normally probably would or what is recommended. Um, obviously, if it happens earlier, the rescue is a lot easier if they can use the gondola and they can come to us from a different vantage point. Um, that said, I mean, these were the, this is something that we've done many, many times and it was a risk that we decided to take. So, and I think that's what also adds into the fear of I don't want to call Art 
I don't want to call Mountain Rescue. I don't want to, you know, first thing you're thinking in my head is, other than feel bad for these guys hiking up this, is, oh, here comes the lecture. So <laughs> well deserved. <laughs> but what we learned from that, not be we've got headlamps in our backpacks now, fire starter kits, like extra paracord, we something to melt water in. Yeah, well you gotta have that no matter what. But yeah, we got we came we became more prepared after that and learned a lot from it, so Did anybody have skids? No. I might have had skids in my backpack. It was like full alpine gear. Full alpine, yeah. But yeah, that wouldn't have mattered. And to Coulter's thing, I, to trust me, when that first pile of snow, you can hear me screaming when you that video first plays, that's because snow was in my mouth. And the first, you know, my first n instinct was to move the snow off my face, which it did. But if it didn't, you know, that, in, I don't know how much good it does, but I had that airbag that I was literally about to pull. You didn't know, I didn't know at that point what was exactly going on. So the question was, what exactly did I do, or did I hit the tree, or did I fall on the tree well? The second question he asked is what the diagnosis was. Um, I'll go with the second one real quick. Uh, spiral fracture on the tibia and fibula, which you don't see in the, that one. Um, I have a plate and 10 screws in there, and I'm actually very fortunate that I don't have any ankle damage. Um, after watching that video over and over, it's probably not the best thing to do, um, I, l I think what happened is I landed where the cliff goes up and the tree meet on the ground. And that's what caught my foot. So my binding couldn't release because there was nowhere for it to go. So it broke on the lower part inside the boot. All right. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate sharing your story. Uh, yeah, we're, we're in the rescue business, not the lecture business. But we are trying to put on more of these education events, and I think we all learn from hearing stories from each other, right? I think we've all done things we would do differently. So let's just take a couple minutes, get up, move around, meet your neighbor, go grab some food. We'll come back, we'll hear some more stories in, say, five minutes. So carrying on with tonight's mission and tonight's class, uh, next up, we got Coulter Hinchcliffe, another Local pro skier, spent a lot of time in the backcountry, a lot of time around helicopters, um, training in all sorts of different ways. And he's going to talk to us about uh, an incident he was involved in last year, right? Yeah, last year? It was a few years two ago. Two years ago. Hello, everybody. In the not too distant past. Thank you, Mountain Rescue, for putting this on and everything you guys do. Thanks, Greg, for putting this together on your birthday, pretty much. Yeah. Um, sure, this is from the very end of the night. We'll just tell the story backwards. How you doing, Billy? Uh, 
Um, not a lot going on, but it's kind of just, I don't know, something I had in my phone that I, after all that, I took my phone out and took a video. Um, but yeah, this is Bill here. He broke his leg. Um, we started up at the top of this pitch here, and he skied first. Um, this is my friend Kalen. And uh, we were going to ski over here, so we were both at the top of the pitch. Um, we were on, in the red tables, which is up like behind Basalt Mountain, basically. Um, we were snowmobile skiing, um, but we weren't. We were like snowmobile ski touring, basically. We snowmobiled in. It was uh, early January, a really, really cold day. Um, we read the Ivy report in the morning, knew that there was considerable risk, and there had been some reports of some um, avalanches on east faces the day before. Um, we went up, and um, I'm really good friends with Kalen. He's my age, grew up in the valley with me. Uh, snowboarder, strong snowmobiler, strong s snowboarder. Um, and this was his friend Bill, who's from Valdez, uh, older gentleman. And that was my first time meeting him. And, uh, but I mean, if Kalen says he's, he's legit, that's pretty much all I need, you know. And uh, he was awesome. He was a good asset to the crew. My snowmobile actually blew up on the way there. Um, so we doubled in to the, to the top. And the way the red tables works, it's just a series of kind of bowls. Um, getting a sled down in there is really difficult. So we just sled to the top, drop in, skin back up. Um, so we like s looked around the bowls to find something we thought was a good aspect to ski. Um, skied it. Our first run, we had great snow quality, no signs of instability. Gave us a little bit of confidence. Um, so then we, we were touring back out and around and uh, came underneath this stuff. Like we came underneath this stuff before we skied it. We're like, oh, that stuff looks cool. Let's go back up there, skin, skinned up around it. And Kaylin and I wanted to ski some like pillowy terrain to the, to the skiers left of this. And Bill, being an older gentleman from Valdez, um, people from Alaska don't actually get to ski that much is sort of the reality. Um, I mean, it rains a lot, and they don't have that many chairlifts, and you know, we're all skiing in Ajax every day, skiing strong, skiing fast, and uh, I kind of attribute that to why this happened in a lot of ways. Um, so he want he was going to ski this more mellow pitch first, um, but Kalen and I fully switched over, took our skins off, got fully ready to ski in case anything happened for him, um, even though what we were going to ski was like 100 meters to the left. And sure enough, halfway down the slope, <laughs> it, it, it rips out. The slope rips out. You can kind of see the crown up there. And honestly, he was skiing fairly slow, um, kind of old man, Alaska turn style. Like, <laughs> and it ripped out, and it just kind of, he sat back on it and, it. and it brought him through these trees here and ended up snapping his leg, um, like right above his boot, tip fib. Um, and uh, just something that I s have said from the beginning and I still believe is uh, I think if it were Kalen and I skiing, I think we would have been skiing at a faster pace and I think it would have been possible to kind of straight line it out of there. Um, he was not skiing in that style. The slide picked him up, brought him through the trees, broke his leg. Um, we were both at the top ready to go. Kalen just, both of us actually immediately went to go get him. Um, and I stopped really quickly, like after only a couple feet. Kalen went all the way down to him. And the reason I stopped is I've gone through a lot of training um, with some of the people I ski with, um, like avalanche and rescue type training. And one of the things you're supposed to do right away is kind of stop and assess the situation, like see what other dangers are lurking and I don't know, just what what the situation is and, and what you can do. And one thing I did right away is I stopped. I'm like, all right, what can I do from up here? What do I have that he doesn't have? And I was like, oh, shit, I, I have cell phone service. So I took my phone out, and I made a call to one of my friends on Mountain Rescue here and told him, because at this point, Bill was screaming bloody murder. He was on top of the snow. We could see him. Kalen was to him. Like, what's going on? He's like, he's got a broken leg. I'm like, how bad? Should I call Mountain Rescue? He's like, it's pretty bad. So I was like, all right. Jordan, we got a broken leg out here. He's like, okay, I'll make some calls. 
give me a pin. So that was kind of my mistake, because I sent him a pin, like an iPhone pin from my phone, just share your location. And then I dropped in and helped, with, helped make a little splint. I guess it's in the, yeah, it's in this one with, uh, looks like we've got some, uh, what is that? It looks like a shovel handle and a probe and some skins. And I think we did have a triangle wrap and some ski straps. I mean, it was something. Um, and then we had to drag him from here over to here, which wasn't far, like 100 meters or something, but it took a while and it really kind of, um, let's, it, it makes you realize how hard it is to move somebody that's injured, even when they're like pretty capable. It's kind of like Jeff. He had, everything was fine except for this one leg. And he, c he was able to, we put him on Kalen's snowboard and he could kind of scooch himself along but with keeping his one leg on the snowboard, but it still took us, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes at least just to move him 100 meters. Um, so that's sort of like a realization, like there was no way in hell we were gonna get him up the hill. There's no, there's no way that's gonna happen. Um, which I think people kind of think, like, ah, oh, if something happens, we'll get you out, we'll pick you up and throw you over our shoulder. It's just not gonna happen. Um, so long story short, we got him out to here. He was a champ, he was going through some pain. And most, another thing is, you think having a backcountry partner is a good idea? It's not really enough. Like, if something happens to you, then it's just one man trying to carry another man. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, so that's something I took away from this, is just more numbers is better. Like, three or four is great, I think. Um, so we get him out to here, and the heli should be here by now, basically. Because uh, we, I got, at the top, I got enough communication with Jordan to like, all right, we're getting this going. Heli should be there like in 45 minutes. And it was late in the day, early January. So short days, getting to be like four o'clock at this point. Helicopter's not there. I don't have service anymore. Helicopter's still not there. Helicopter's still not there. And uh, eventually I just started working my way back up the hill. I could have put my skins back on, but I'm just kind of frantic. And I, it was so cold that our phones were dying. So I had Kaylin and I's phone. One was like in my armpit, one was in my hand. And I'm like trying to get in touch with this guy, sending text messages. And eventually they would go through here and there. And I was just like sidestepping up this hill, just like looking for service, just like sidestepping, looking, oh, I've got a little service and, and getting a message out. I'm losing it again. And so I spent a lot of time doing that. Um, long story short, the, f the pin I sent was super inaccurate. It was sending him way over towards Harry Gates Hut, which is like 20 miles away probably. Um, so they were like looking for us, looking for us, looking for us, never could find us. Um, so finally like we had to back and forth, like can you go onto your compass map, your compass app on your phone and give us your actual GPS coordinates, which I was able to do, but I had to like, convert them into a text message. I couldn't like screenshot it and send it to him. I had to like remember the number like 295 North, 185 West or whatever it is and um, text them out, um, which I did. And then eventually the helicopter came and landed in the dark, which I was, I, I was like, shit, it's dark. Kaylin in the meantime was down there with Bill building a snow cave the whole time, getting ready to spend the night. We were prepared to spend the night and I'm pretty sure we would have survived. I think the three of us in a small snow cave, huddled up, would have been romantic. <laughs> um, but yeah, the heli came and it landed right at dark, a little after. Um, and one thing that kind of surprised me is it was not mountain rescue, it was flight for life. And out hopped two nurses and the pilot. And I expected them to just take over. And that didn't really happen. They were like, all right, what do you want to do? How do you want to move them? And I'm like, I don't <laughs> Really? You're asking me this? Um, but I mean, they're, they were out of their element. Um, they were not mountain rescue. They're f out of the hospital room. Um, so they, they're in the mountains, and it's dark and cold, and there's snow everywhere. So I mean, it was, it was pretty simple. We just strapped them to a backboard. And the four of us picked him up and clipped him into the helicopter, and then the helicopter took off, and then we're just standing there. And actually, another thing, <laughs> my skins are in his little cast thing that we've built. So the last thing I had to do is like, all right, bye, Bill. But before we leave, I have to rip these out of here, and it's going to hurt. <laughs> it's like, all right, do it. Arr! But that's something to consider if you're building a splint 
with the materials you have, being your shovel and your probe and things like that. I mean, that's what you have and that's what you have to use, but if it's something that you're gonna need to continue to survive, maybe keep those out of it. <laughs> um, so yeah, then we skinned out and snowmobiled home and Bill got a rod put in his leg and he was skiing like six weeks later, so. That's basically the end of my story. Um, before we do any questions, just a couple things I learned. Um, now I carry uh, in reach. I mean, not all the time, but often, especially if I'm going somewhere. It's always in my snowmobile because it, there's no extra like weight issue there, you know. But even a, even an in reach is something I consider on certain missions. Like, do I want that weight, you know? Um, but yeah, that's something that I have now and that I always bring if I'm going somewhere that's out of service because. Just like the other story we heard tonight, helicopter rescue, just it, that's the ultimate bailout. And it's, uh, you don't want to depend on it, but if it's an option, if it can be an option, it's like a thousand times better than anything else. Um, but yeah, any questions? What would you do differently? What would I do differently? What would we do differently? I don't know. Maybe nothing. I would go ski with Bill again any day. I think that that slope we skied was uh, fairly, like, you know, it wasn't like a super dangerous choice. It was like a fairly manageable choice. Um, we talked about everything that was happening the whole time. We took, we knew we were taking a risk, and we took it, and we got, you know, we ended up on the wrong side of of, uh, of the risk, and that's going to happen. I mean, I'm not going to not go ski in the backcountry because this kind of things happen. Um, I would have an inReach next time. I would send my GPS coordinates rather than a pin. Um, having more layers would have been really good as well. Um, Bill was like, I always have down pants with me, but I left them at home today. Um, and that, that would have been huge because it was cold. It was like a high of five degrees that day or something. So having extra layers would have just like made us more comfortable had we had to spend the night. Um, but yeah, like we, I don't know, I feel like we we're considering everything all day long. We were, had a lot of talk about it. It wasn't like this, like, holy shit, we have an avalanche. I never thought that was going to happen. Like we were very aware that that was a possibility. Nate. Question was calling uh, 911 versus calling a friend. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like the reason I called a friend is because there's like a personal connection there where they're going to care more and do things and help help you more. Um, I don't know what the difference would have been, like if that would have been a better idea or a worse idea. I mean, I couldn't, I don't think I could text 911 a pin. Um, so I don't know, I think I would do the same thing. It's kind of nice to have, feel like you, somebody that actually cares about you is on the other side. Um, do you think it's a better idea to One call 911? One thing to think about, so if you do call 911, let's say your phone dies, they might be able to get a, a GPS coordinate off that phone call. So if you're low on juice and you can only make one phone call, that might be a good move. You can text 911 as well. Here in Pickin County, you can text 911. They will not get GPS off that, right? So if you get a phone, they can get GPS. It might cut off, but you can maybe have more of a conversation through text. No. Question was, do we have a text? But no, it just it all goes through the sheriff. So Mountain Rescue is saying always call 911. Call Don't call them. They'll call us. <laughs> Thank you, Coulter. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. So you guys are going to have to go online. I am apologize for the projector being the way it is. We're, we're dealing. Uh, but you have to see these photos. I think it's great photos of like an improvised splint. They're pretty neat. Um, so go check it out online. All right. Keep the party rolling. Next, we're going to hear from David and Shana Richardson, who is out. David, uh, Shana is his wife now. They were dating at the time. And they, David was out hiking with his partner, Jared. 
that did uh, the south and to north maroon traverse. Um, he put together a little video that will start off, which kind of tells the story a little bit better about kind of what happened, what the day was like. Then we'll uh, hear their perspective. There's something about when you get on top of those mountains and you look, out, look around, you're on top of the world. Probably the first time I went to Aspen and, and saw the bells, and then you start hearing the stories about how dangerous they are. That you're just like, there's certainly a draw to say, well, I want to, I want to conquer those. The thing that I always look back as being that fatal flaw in, in the bells in October was our route finding. We we did fine for three quarters of the day, and as we were trying to come down, we lost it. Well, we got to that second peak, and it was good, but I think we were both a little, we are tired at that point. How are you feeling, Jared? Amazing. Yeah, it's pretty Crushing. awesome. Crushing cold. We'd been moving pretty fast all day, so nine hours of ascent. And I think that's really our big mistake there, was not really taking a taking the time at the top of that mountain and figuring out how we're getting down. We were both aware of what time of day it was and that we still had a, a ways to go. But in some ways, you, you've made the summit of both peaks and you've made the traverse. You feel like, part of you feel like, feels like the, the hard work is done. At that point, we were pushing it a little too hard. We were, instead of slowing down to make a really good decision, we were trying to make the right decision quickly so that we could keep moving. He was moving and I reached a point where, and it might have saved me, the fact that I might, I hurt myself bad enough that I couldn't get over that fear of, of falling again, that I couldn't try and lower myself down because I didn't want to fall again. I think that I was able to communicate pretty clearly with them exactly what had happened, uh, how I felt. You know, they were asking, well, where's Jared? I'm like, well, I think he's, he's got to be over on the north side if you guys haven't seen him yet. I think it was the sheriff that came in and, and told me that they found Jared and that he wasn't alive. I think for me, being out here for three or four summers, you get kind of lured into this, I'm strong, I'm athletic, I've been out here enough, oh, I can just push it a little bit more, I can push it a little bit more, but there's a little difference in being prepared for, you know, you, you can overtrust yourself. At that point when we decided we were gonna do that second peak, was that the right call? No. Check your ego at the door. When Jared and I started coming down that, that mountain, instead of stopping and saying, hey, what exactly are we supposed to be doing here? Where do we need to go? Where do we not want to go? It's that preparation. It's that, it's that knowing where you're going. It's knowing what could go wrong and, and how you're going to, how you're going to respond to those emergency situations. seen that in a while. Um, so I think that kind of gives a pretty good rundown of like what the, the story was that day. A friend and uh, Jared that I was climbing with, we went out to hike Maroon Bells. It was uh, mid-October 
Um, we, summited so, we summited South Maroon, and the plan was to do just one peak that day, and uh, we decided to make the traverse, which took a lot longer than we expected, was harder climbing than we expected. Um, and when we got to North Maroon, the route finding was difficult, difficult because of a lot of snow. So we made some decisions up there, and um, you know, I think uh, the the hard part is that you know I, I came back and, and Jared didn't. So when I Greg spoke to me about speaking at this event about what it was like to be rescued, um, I would say the first thing that when you see the helicopters come in after spending a couple of unexpected nights outside when it snows is that it feels like the cavalry's arrived. There's no better feeling than to see Mountain Rescue show up. So um, just a reminder to everyone that's part of this organization that what you do is important um, and can't put a dollar value or enough gratitude or thank you for um, the work that you guys uh, do when you show up um, when things go wrong in the backcountry. Um, uh, and then I guess kind of the, the, the other part of the experience that I like to kind of share going forward from, from my experience is that, you know, it is, it is trauma. There's, you know, we deal with physical trauma in the backcountry, whether it's broken legs um, or, in, uh, you know, death obviously being the, the biggest consequence. Um, you know, I dealt with a little bit of frostbite and some physical issues. Um, but trauma also, I think, affects us mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Um, and so I think just being aware of when people do come back from being uh, in one of these situations, whether it's just an injury or if it's a loss of a friend, or um, being aware of that there is some consequence that's got to be addressed, you know, whether it's through your social network and your friends and your family. But I found that it was also really important to um, to seek out some counseling to go through this um, type of event. And it took me a few years before I started to really reach out um, and, and navigate through some of those um, mental, emotional, spiritual aspects of the trauma. Um, so I think that's kind of my biggest lesson that I've taken away from it is that, um, you know, we're, we all, I guess, take some level of risk when we go out in the backcountry. And um, I would say that I've been probably significantly more cautious since this happened almost five years ago. Um, but that also being said that there are, cal there are calculated risks that we take. And um, I think there's also a big fear. I heard it mentioned up here earlier about being the one that makes the call or being the one that shows back up. and has to deal with the lecture of what kind of bad decision did you make today and hopefully more people talking about their experience about what it's like being rescued maybe takes a little bit of that stigma away um, and makes it okay to share what these experiences are and um, hopefully we can all learn from mistakes that others have made and maybe make a few less on our own. Um, so I guess I'll let Sheena kind of step in here um, and because she can share a little bit more about the experience of what it was like being the person to interact with Mountain Rescue and the sheriff uh, when I was missing. I was not afraid to make the call. <laughs> Lucky for him, I suppose. But um, yeah, uh, Jared and David were due back on, I think it would have been Wednesday around 6. And this is the photo actually that... Um, David sent to me from the summit. He was able to get cell service up there, and so he sent this with a text message saying that um, took a lot longer than they expected, and they were going to be home later than expected. And I think I was originally planning on hearing from them sometime in the afternoon. Um, six o'clock came around, and then it was nine o'clock, and I was like, I just didn't feel right, so um, called that night, and definitely got the okay nothing we can do right now. Um, thanks for the heads up. This is, you know, a mountain where self-rescues are actually pretty common, so let's wait till the morning. So at 6 a.m. I'm calling back. <laughs> I'm like, okay, how about now? And they're like, all right, well, we need daylight, so let's wait for that. I'm like, all right. Um, and at that point, I had there was a friend that was supposed to go with them that I hadn't met. Um, and for, 
I think it was work reasons he couldn't go. And so I think one of the biggest things that I learned is that I wasn't familiar with the route that they were going to take. Because um, that was one of the questions that they were asking me, like, well, which route they were, were they taking? And I was like, I have no idea. Um, so I reached out to this friend on Facebook and I was like, hey, you know, which route were they planning? Um, and he's like, they're not back yet. And I'm like, no. I was like, well, I'm going over there. I was like, great. Can you pick me up? Because I'd like to go too. We lived in Vail at the time. And um, so we drove over and yeah, the weather was terrible for um, all intensive purposes. There was a lot of um, cloud coverage. There was snow and rain and um, we came by um, this building. It was actually, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but at the time you guys said this was the first um, mission that you had in this building. Um, so it was brand new and sparkly. And nobody <laughs> really knew where things were and we're just getting used to it and it was, um, and it was awesome. You guys were also, you could see the kind of excitement's not the right word, but you know, kind of settling into your new digs and being able to um, use this space for what it was designed for. So um, I, I gave you guys the picture and you were able to, which is one of the coolest things that I had, didn't know was possible. Like from this picture, um, I think you sent it out to the army or somebody and they were able to like kind of get the pings and um, find out where we were thinking that they were on north. This was actually taken on the South Maroon Peak. And so that kind of changed the game as far as where are we looking for these guys. And um, yeah, we spent the night here. Um, Cole is his name, the friend that we came over with. And um, yeah, I, I really kept myself very singly focused on kind of one phrase in my head the entire time. A lot of people always ask, like, how on earth did you not just lose it? Um, it's because all I did was like, safe and sound, 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 safe and sound. And just, I literally probably said it about a million times. Um, and Cole had a really cute puppy. I don't know if you guys remember Captain, but he had this adorable Shiba Inu puppy that was a really helpful distraction as well. Um, Cole and I did go out and hike for a little while and um, probably, I also learned that um, we were a little stubborn um, in wanting to just get out there and help and do something and um, so we went out and started hiking, gave ourselves a time limit on when we were going to turn back and then we get back and Mountain Rusty's like, okay, well now we don't have two more missing, thanks. And I was like, oh shit, that was, that's our bad. Definitely learned that lesson. Like you guys know what you're doing and, and, and following your instructions is definitely the move to make. Um, yeah, um, the next morning, Friday morning, you know, I think at that point it had been well over 48 hours and um, that's a hard time frame. And I had a lot of people looking at me and trying to sit me down and prepare me for the worst, which I certainly understand is your job. And um, I just, didn't really want to let my mind go there. I knew it was a possibility that um, he wouldn't be coming back, but I decided to remain hopeful instead. And I know a couple of you thought I was crazy. I could see it in your eyes, but that's all right. Um, I, I trusted that what was going to happen was going to happen. One of the team members took me to do some yoga, and that was um, a pretty powerful experience um, to be able to just kind of take all of the prayers and love and gratitude that everybody was sending our way and kind of offer that up. And um, as soon as we, s we, we got done doing that, the phone started ringing and they had said that they had found David, which was um, nothing short of a miracle. And yeah, um, I can't ever say thank you enough for this team and what you guys do, the fact that you do it as volunteers is just absolutely mind-blowing. Um, to watch you guys work the way that you did was just, it was unbelievable. Um, you you do feel really helpless and, you know, like, what am I supposed to do? Just sit here and try and think about what's not going to happen or could be happening? Um, but your team was just really incredible. They were s supportive and to watch you guys just make moves and do what needed to be done and um, it was it was something that I am just forever grateful for and, and indebted to you guys for.
I did do a little Facebook event. We, we raised a thousand dollars for tonight, so just wanted to just a little something to say thank you. Thank you to everybody that's watching that donated too. Thank you. Um, there's no amount of money. There's no amount of thank yous. There's nothing that could really ever really truly say thank you for what you guys do. But um, from the bottom of my heart, you gave me a husband, so that's great. <laughs> so yeah. Questions? Any questions? You guys got engaged weeks after it? Or he, asked, he asked about when we got engaged. We actually were engaged when it happened. Um, and I guess to finish the story, we, we did do a pop-up wedding just a few days after. So David went to Aspen Hospital and that spent the night? No. They took you down. Yeah, so the um, helicopter, which came out of um, Dotsera, which is the... Um, the, yeah, the, the hats. Um, they brought me to Aspen Valley Hospital, and then I was transferred down to Denver Health with uh, Flight for Life. Spent the night at uh, Denver Health, um, and then um, was back in Vail the next day. Yeah, we had a, a friend who was um, very efficient in putting together just a place for all of our, all of our family was flying in, and um, you know, we were like, life's a little too short, so let's just, let's just do this tonight. So about two days after they found him, um, we just got married. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, when in Rome. <laughs> yes. Um, so we she asked how we got separated. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so as we were coming down off North Maroon, um, we started to descend onto the North Face, which was a bunch of cliff bands. Um, and as we were trying to descend one cliff band, um, he fell first, um, and then I tried to follow him in that same direction. I fell um, the same fall that he had taken, probably 25 or 30 feet, um, on top of a thin layer of snow onto rocks. Um, and uh, we both were okay, I mean, not significantly hurt, but I was, I was hurt enough that I had a hard time putting any weight on my left side um, to, to climb down any further cliff bands, and that was really our only option as, as we'd moved down onto that uh, north face of the mountain. Um, sun was dropping, um, so we were on the summit of North Maroon at three o'clock. I wanna say sunset that day was about 6.30, um, so it was again one of those things where we were chasing daylight. Um, and got to a point and he kept climbing down and I kept pacing back and forth over top of this cliff ledge trying to figure out how I was gonna get down. Um, and the sun was setting and um, I couldn't bring myself over that ledge. Um, so the first night I did along that cliff band that I was standing on, um, I found like a small cave and just spent the night underneath there. So that's how we got separated. Um, what were your injuries? Um, what were his injuries? <laughs> uh, I, I had some frostbite on my feet. My uh, feet were really swollen. I can't remember what that was um, credited to, but um, really just uh, some bruising along my left hip, left shoulder, um, and then about three months of, what was the nerve injury called? Mm. Uh, neuropathy. neuropathy. Neuropathy, yeah. That's it. Thank you. Um, We we found out about Jared when I was at Aspen Valley Hospital. So um, I was um, they brought me out on a Blackhawk helicopter, brought me to um, Aspen Valley Hospital. Um, and while I was on the helicopter, they were asking about where Jared was located. And I said, well, if he's not already down, you haven't found him already, then he's probably somewhere along the north side of the mountain. Um, so after they took me to the hospital, they took the mountain uh, rescue team back into Maroon Bell's area. And then they, they found his body um, on the north side of the mountain. 
the sheriff came in and told me while I was at the hospital. Yes? Did you end up feeling like the um, altitude um, played a role in your decision making, you know, like hypoxia up there? Did you feel like the altitude played a role in your decision making? Um, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't attribute the decision making to being altitude influenced. I feel like it was um, maybe being a little overconfident um, and a little unprepared for the conditions based on what both of our experience was at that point. June 8th, come to peak awareness. It's important. When you guys separated, was there any like conversation about like I'm going this way, I'm going that way, or was it just you were both kind of like looking different corners of the mountain and then you're like, this is gonna follow me and then So he he asked about when we got separated, what kind of communication happened there. Um, I think to be really candid, I think it was um, after taking that fall, that 20, 25 foot fall, we were both probably, you know, if we want to think about what influenced our, our thinking and communication at that point, I think there, we were both pretty rattled. Um, and so the response was it just started moving really quickly. Um, so I, I wish I could elaborate more, but I remember him going down that last cliff and I was just pacing back and forth trying to figure out if I was, how I could follow him. Um, he had also, before we took that first fall, he didn't want to climb down that face with his bag on his back. Um, so he had dropped his bag over the, over the cliff and it kind of hit and run. Um, so I think he was kind of motivated to at least try and get towards his gear. And that, that could have played a role in why um, he moved as quickly without us staying together. Um, and again, I thinking about lessons learned staying together. I think that's something we can all take, whether it's winter, summer, fall. Did he end up dying from a fall? Yes. Was he with his bag when he had his bag? I believe he was. They, he, I don't think he got to his bag. I think he was still far away from his bag. Well, was his intention of going down without you to get, re get someone to rescue you? I, you know, again, at that point, I feel like it was just trying to get out. I think, it, there, I think there was, after taking the fall, I think there was a little bit of panic in both of our decision making. Um, and I might have just been saved by having a little bit of injury and a little bit more fear or a little bit more caution. Um, I, I don't remember really having any conversations about, hey, you're going to go get help and I'm going to stay here. It was more of like, hey, let's keep going. Let's keep, keep trying to get out of here. Because um, it's, it's tricky on that north face because you can see the parking lot. You can see where the car is. You can see where you want to, where you need to go. It's just, it's just not really a direct route to get there. At least the direction we were going. Um, I haven't, I have not climbed um, the Maroon Bell since. I've been back a few times. Thank you guys so much for sharing your story. I want to thank all the speakers for sharing their stories. Uh, I think we all learned a lot. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot to think about. So on the note brought up about future education, our next course, our next event is June 8th. Mark your calendars. Your best bet would even be to go on our website now. And there's a link there that says Summer Workshop More Info. When you go to that, all you'll get is a place to sign up for our mailing list. And what happens there is I send out an email to everybody on our mailing list saying, hey, registration's open, sign up now before we do a big push and things sell out. So sign up, choose the classes you want to take. Uh, if there's any more questions, I'm sure the speakers might hang out for a minute or two. Um, thank you all for coming. Drive safe. <laughs>